Sometimes you just need to turn off the distractions, get to work, and find the universal truths that affect us all and that govern our universe. This is a good place to do that. Mark Fultz and Kat Hobson will try to help with that a bit by bringing fantastic guests. Let's see what's happening tonight. Welcome to Universal Truths with Mark Fultz, coming to you from WBHMDB in Birmingham, Alabama, and I'm coming to you from my sweet little cute home near Pensacola, Florida, and of course, you know, we're kind of a paranormal show, and so tonight, I'm going to cover spiritualism and Mary Todd Lincoln and the seances and things like that she did in the White House because she was a spiritualist and she brought that to um, to the most famous house in the country. And but what before I tell talk about her, I'll talk about her probably in the second part of the show. The first part we're going to talk spiritualism and and what that was and what it is and and what a huge movement it was at one time. And uh actually it it was just it would have if it had continued on the path it was, it would have been as you would know it like you would know like Baptist or Episcopal, you know, it was it was a pretty big religion, religious movement, spiritual movement. But um, before we get into all of that, of course, uh, I live here near Pensacola, Florida, and anyone that wants to meet me in person, I work out of Live and Let Live Metaphysical Store, 4622, uh, Softly Field Road, and uh, I work in the stores, usually in the weekends, like Friday, Saturday. And uh, there's myself and two other psychics, Tony Talley and Terry O'Connor, and um, Sal Gandafa owns the store. Matthew Ferguson runs, helps him run it. And uh, it's a really a fascinating metaphysical place. It has more stuff in it than I've ever. I've worked in several metaphysical stores. It has more stuff than I've ever seen in one place. And uh, but it it's really a good place to go if you want to come and have a, a spiritualist kind of movement because I do tarot and mediumship and um, it's uh, a good way to you know come and see what that's like because uh, I will be talking about spiritualism tonight and uh, I have spiritualist roots I of course I started into metaphysics when I was 18 now I'm 60. So I trained in a specific type of metaphysics and then evolved. And after I was attacked and came back from being attacked, you know, nearly dead, near death, and it changed the way that I functioned metaphysically. And so uh, I naturally always had a 
an attraction to spiritualism, uh, but the old-fashioned version of it. I don't know about the new modern, the modern version. Eh, you know, for me, it's not so hot. It's not. It's not for me because uh, I don't join religion or religious movements or spiritual movements. Uh, you know, 100% of anything because. Once you do, then people tell you what to do. They tell you how you're supposed to think and how you feel. That's when I was a child and I was a Baptist. You know, they tell you, you know, how bad you are or how good you are or, or you know, you'll never, you know, do this, do this, do this, or you're a bad person. And um, I've learned over my life, I take what I find is positive from different walks of life and different spiritual and religious beliefs. And then uh, I avoid <laughs> the, the the pitfalls. Uh, I don't like anyone telling me how I can connect with my God aspect or goddess aspect or, you know, you have to go through me to get the message across or you have to listen to me and follow me to do what you you want to do, you know, it's like, no, each person has their connection to their God source, whether it's God source or goddess source or whatever, you know, what works for you. And, um, you, you have your own connection. And there's been so many strict religious movements, you know, I mean, in, in where I come from, it's Baptist, Methodist, Episcopal, Catholic, and most of those, you know, they they look at each one going, you know, you know, oh, well, they're an idolater, or they, they worship statues, or, uh, you know, they each one has something bad to say about each other, and, and when I say things that I'm not trying to down another religion, it's just that for me, there are certain things that don't work. Well, when I started being on my own, when I was a, a uh, I started off as a third degree gardenarian, and uh, I didn't like gardenarian, <laughs> but it was who my teacher that was their path, and I was trained in that, and I didn't like it, but I made it through it. Uh, but it taught me a lot of discipline. Um, and then I evolved into my own thing because I found out, you know, being in groups, cause I had another group I almost joined and then, you know, I just don't like the leader and the follower thing, uh, because if you're following somebody, if they have an ulterior motive, then you have to put up with that stuff. And, you know, then you're not developing who you are. You're following. You think you don't know enough, so you're following this person. You're listening to this person. And so I'm quite into, you know, you can practice things, get around people who believe the same thing, but be a solitary person. Develop who you are. If you're a Christian, try and develop the positive aspects of Christianity. You know, from where I come from, there's, I know. I mean, I I know very positive Christians, but from the my family, it was really the hardcore Baptist kind of thing that you know everybody else is you know kind of dirt and da 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 da. So it's not necessarily the way it was being taught in the church. It's just that my family lobbed onto it in a different way. So uh, there's so much wonderful, beautiful things in Christianity. So, you know, be that, you know, if you're in Wicca or you're in, uh, you're a Catholic or you're, you know, find the positive. And uh, when I was on my own, um, I studied some spiritualism, and actually because I've always had it in there, and what was great about spiritualism you know, when it started off, it um, dealt directly, you know, it, it was uh, really kind of a feminist movement, 
uh, it was ruled mostly by women. But, uh, and we'll get into the roots of it here in a minute. But uh, it, gave, it put people who used their human experience to connect with spirits and talk to spirits, have seances, do readings, um, do healings, do, you know, it was just to, oh, it, was, it, it was like going back to the Stone Age. You know, where people just, they weren't afraid of spirits. The, uh, everyday life is affected by spiritual work and spiritual paths and talking to the spirits who are trying to help you. So it opened a door for expansion that we haven't seen in a long time in America. And um, I just was very... Uh, interested in it. And too, when I was a child, see, out of spiritualism, you have, you know, Ouija boards and seances and things like that, uh, that came out of that movement. And when I was a child for, I was, I remember watching Dark Shadows when I was four. I was four when they, uh, you know, Barnabas raised out of the casket and got out. And, um, that show, I rewatched it a few years ago, and after not seeing it 40 something years, and there were some stretches in it, they would have seances. They would go back in time, they had seances, they had witches, they had vampires, they had um, all of this kind of stuff. They covered everything. But they used a lot of seancing in that show. And I was really shocked that America in 1960, we, you know, because there was so much censorship going on. I was really shocked to see something that would have shocked a lot of religious people. I'm sure it did. Uh, but it was so wildly popular. And it influenced the kids. It influenced um, the hippies because the hippies got into the antique clothing and the capes and the dresses. And the, so they began going to thrift stores and, and wearing antique clothing and, and stuff. And, I, and it influenced me because uh, I go, oh, I want to do that. I want to do a seance. I want to be a medium. Uh, I like that hypnotism kind of looking thing, you know, they would do, they'd swing a little watch in front of somebody and, and, um, they had people who were, uh, mystical and had mystical powers and abilities and, and, um, and it influenced me, I guess. And then a few years ago, I mean, cause I've been in, in, when I was in the metaphysical community in Chattanooga, I just started doing those kind of things. I was working at a metaphysical store and I had read a book. I think her name was Susan Northrup. And there was a book called The Seance. And she taught how to do modern seancing. And I remember reading that book. And sitting there with uh, Wilma Tucker, who owned the store. Hi, Wilma. And uh, I said, I could do that. So, you know, we picked a few times, once a month or so, and I would do a seance. And I remember the very first time that it happened, and I had everybody, hold, they, uh, you know, what I would do is have everyone close their eyes while I was channeling. And then I would feel the spirit move, and then I would talk. You know, I would be ready. And I remember the first time that it happened, while they had their eyes closed, I thought, ooh, what if it don't come? Maybe I should get up and run out of here before, you know, before they open their eyes. But I sat there, and it happened. And then I went to each person, talked to their spirits, told them things that no one else knew. And I realized, you know, you just have to be uh, your conduit. You have to just be brave enough to have your own beliefs and to be open. And 
it changed me. It opened me. Every time I did a seance, it increased my abilities and my sensitivity and my uh, ability to look at other people, look at their electrical system, see what's going on around them. So, you know, um, people who are scientific would probably go poo, poo, poo on this, poo, poo, poo. They poo, poo everything. You know, that's metaphysical. Well, spiritualism and, and spiritism and all that comes from human experience, which is thousands and thousands of years old. And science is only an infant. It's been around, what, two, three hundred years. And it doesn't know the answers to everything. And there's so many things they can't explain that are human experience. So it's not a woo-woo thing. It's not... It's more not supernatural, but super normal. And spiritualist and, and mediums, which I am, uh, we go with what's natural and we follow our instincts and we allow ourselves to be brave enough to do it. Those who are real practitioners of doing being mediums, uh, you know, you have to be kind of brazen. I work every day that I'm in the store, I'm doing mediumship. And people don't realize I do prayers in the morning and prayers in the evening and prayers during the day to make sure I'm keeping my energy at a certain pitch so that when someone comes to me, they can benefit from what I have to offer. And also I have to benefit from it. I have to be able to do the right work. I want to be on spot anytime I talk to somebody about that stuff because you don't know one thing you can tell someone will change their lives, change the direction of their lives. Uh, someone I talked to today, I helped them release the guilt they had over their father dying and them not being able to this and the spirit was saying don't you know get rid of the guilt and then they just start crying but you get messages to the thing is for spiritualism is to check on the people who have died make sure they're okay Make sure you can communicate with them because one day we're all going to be dead. We are all going to be ghosts. We're all ghosts in waiting and spirits in waiting. And spiritualism helps those who've gone on. Since we don't, as modern people, don't practice, uh, we're not afraid, you know, to not be afraid of death, to accept death. We're afraid of death. We're confused by death. And it's actually such a beautiful experience when it gets past a certain point that in the old days, they had ways, coping mechanisms to understand death is inevitable. We have to face it. We have to accept it. And when it's our turn, we have to step to that door. You don't have a choice when it's time. And we should uh, develop ways where we can let people go and say, you know, you hear a little bird, you know, fly away. Uh, go to where, and when, I, when it's my turn, I'll come and be with you. You're just going ahead of me. And that's how I deal with death. I feel like the person is going on vacation, basically. And they're going away on vacation to a beautiful experience, people they love, people that love them. And then when it's my turn to go on vacation, then I'll be back with them. And then I'll be waiting for the uh, people I love that are here. Uh, so spiritualism helps get you past the surface and into the spirit itself. So now I'm going to have to go to a break and we'll be back to discuss spiritualism and Mary Todd Lincoln and seances in the, in the White House. 
it's it's a pretty good show. So all of you out there in the dark, don't touch that dial. We'll be right back. Warning, the following message does not necessarily reflect the views of WBHMDB or its hosts, guests, listeners, or of any functioning adult in general. In fact, Frank should probably seek professional help. Listener discretion is advised. Hi there, Frank Lee here. I thought that I would spend a few moments telling you about the positivity from the network here. Uh, the overall message of para unity and happiness and how everyone here wants to get along with everyone out there and how everything is just wonderful wait cat's not looking <laughs> okay i've got something to really tell you So I'm going to tell you what's really going on. Honestly, all that being nice and positive crap was kind of hurting my soul, as dark as it is. So, what's really happening? You see it all the time. Everybody and their brother out there has a paranormal team because they watch a couple of episodes of Ghost Hunters or some crap like that. So they go and they spend half their mortgage payment on tools and things that light up that they don't understand. And then the next logical step after buying matching black t-shirts and posing like 90s rappers for their Facebook page is to of course have their own podcast. Well, you know what? You're not gonna find that crap here. What we have here at WBHM Digital Broadcasting is the best host, the best guest, bringing you real information. All of the hosts here on this network know their stuff. They are the people who have been out there doing the work, doing actual research. And no, by research, I don't mean binge watching some kind of cheesy TV show on Netflix. I mean reading books. I mean out in the field doing the lay work. And who are they interviewing on their shows? They're bringing you the people they have learned from. They're bringing you the best in the field covering all kinds of topics from UFOs and aliens to Bigfoot to cryptozoology to ghosts to anything you can think of a bit strange and unexplained it is here and you're going to get the best information here so stay tuned to WPHM Digital Broadcasting don't go anywhere speaking of going somewhere I've got to go before my mic gets cut. We'll see you there on WBHM DB. Welcome back to Universal Truths with Mark Fultz. I'm coming to you from WBHM DB in beautiful Birmingham, Alabama, and I am at my home near beautiful Pensacola, Florida. I'm in my, uh, I live in vacation land, and uh, what a vacation it is, let me tell you. But we are doing our show tonight about spiritualism and Mary Todd Lincoln and her influence of spiritualism at the time in the White House. So let me kind of go into what spiritualism the movement was. In 1848, in Hydesville, New York, there was um, a little family rented a house, and uh, there were three daughters, Leah and Margarita and Kate, Kat, excuse me, I want to say Kat, Kat but it's Kate. And... Um, there apparently was some kind of metaphysical stuff going on in the house, paranormal activity, you know, knockings and things like that. And the basic story from my childhood that I remember is that the three girls, when they got over the nervousness of hearing the knocks, they started playing and knocking back. 
and it began a communication thing. And then people started coming by the hundreds to listen to these girls talk to a spirit that they called Mr. Splitfoot, but they said his name was Charles B. Rosna, that he was a peddler who had been murdered in the house, buried in the basement, and that was his spirit talking to them. And they came up with yes and no's and, you know, a knock for each letter in the alphabet. So they began being able to table, do that at a table. And that began table tipping and all this stuff. So at some point, they decided to take these girls on a tour to show this skill of talking to spirits. Well, it ignited a spiritual movement, the the spiritualist, and people took it further. You know, people developed groups and developed books, and, and very intelligent, learned people uh, became, you know, got to, uh, everybody is psychic, naturally. We have it as a sense of smell. So... All the religions that were out at that time were very strict, and you couldn't do these things. You couldn't talk to spirits, and in the Bible, they have several times when they talk to spirits, but they always acted like it was evil for the person to do it, but it's a natural thing. It's not a devil thing. That's a, The devil is, is a different religion's um, belief system, you know, the belief system I'm part of doesn't believe, you know, that there's a lot of evil out there in the world, but there isn't it like a hell you go to and burn in forever, which I was told when I was a kid, you know, you're, uh, you're, I mean, it's like out of Gone with the Wind when she's, when uh, Scarlett O'Hara said, I know there's a hell, I was raised on it. And that's the way I felt when I was a kid. I was like, dang, you can't do anything. You're going to hell no matter how good you are. Uh, but spiritualism brought in a positive thing instead of it took out the middle man having to go to somebody to tell you, um, you know, I'm going to talk to you from you to God. You have to come to me first. It began with us being able to communicate with the spirits ourselves and our inner spirit. And uh, it was a very positive thing. And then in their workings, they began, that's where the American version of the psychic came through and began and doing table tippings and doing, you know, Ouija board kind of things before they came up with the Ouija board. But they, they did other things before that with talking boards and talking tables and table tipping was incredibly and and popular and levitating tables, and uh, which has happened to me once, which was fascinating. I had a table just slide out from my hand and go three feet away from me, and it was uh, quite amazing. And uh, when I've done table tipping, I've gotten knocking everywhere except the table, so I've got to work on it more. Uh, but it moved to where everybody could do this. You didn't have to be in a group. You could be at home and do these things. And um, so then it began something when it became kind of a feminist movement. Because women, if you had a job, it was mostly cleaning or being a nursemaid or being a nanny or housekeeper or cook or a wife. That was your options. And this made it where women and men, there were men, psychics and everything in the spiritualist movement, but the women were very protective of it because it was the first time they could set up shop, be a psychic, do readings, make their own living, and not have to be married to do it or work for somebody to do it, they could do it and make their own money. And and alongside it, spiritualism 
uh, the rise in voodoo was also came about the same time after the Civil War. Because after the Civil War, those who had been formerly enslaved, they had to find new jobs because now they could raise their own money. But the thing was, there weren't that many great jobs going on because the, the country was kind of poor after the war. And the jobs they had to get usually were just terrible. And to work for these people who were bitter and, you know, about the war and bitter about this and bitter about that. So they saw the psychics making a business out of it and being able to raise their own money. So Buddha priests and priestesses also did the same thing. And so hand in hand, it gave people minorities, it gave people who normally wouldn't have a way to live. It gave them prestige, respect. There were people who respected many of these people. And also fear in some cases. Some people uh, in Chattanooga, I found tons and tons and tons of stories of, you know, uh, voodoo and spiritualism. And um, there was uh, an old voodoo priestess that was very respected. Named, they called her Old Aunt Lou. But, you know, and if uh, you respected her and you stayed out of her way, you know, because she was very powerful. And... Um, and I have that in my tour online, Chattanooga Chills Ghost, Ghost Tour Online. Um, but every city has those stories. The spiritualist movement was huge, and it became enormous during the Civil War because thousands, hundreds of thousands of young men marched out the door, went to be in war, were killed. It was before dog tags. Uh, so they might not be able to be identified. They died like in Chattanooga. There was or near Chattanooga, the Chickamauga battlefield. At one time, 34,000 men were killed in a two day period. And so they just dug holes and dug trenches and dumped the bodies in the holes. And so you wouldn't know what happened to your son. They were just buried somewhere. Um, or they went out and they died in the woods. Or, you know, they there's no telling what happened to them. So they just knew their children disappeared. So they would go to the psychics and the spiritualists to talk to their child and see if they were all right, if they suffered, if they needed help. Um, to talk to them to see how they were doing. And it was a very good coping medic mechanism because they just didn't know. And the country did not make a process where they would get their children back because the, in these places like Chickamauga Battlefield, it's a graveyard of all these unknown men. And so it helped the families deal with it because if you didn't, you would lose your mind worrying about is he suffering? Is he laying in the, in the woods dying? Did he, did he, you know, uh, did someone help him? Did somebody take care of him or was he alone? You know, so these seances became dear to people and uh, it, it just, during the civil war, it just, was an enormous popular coping mechanism. And then it became groups of people who then began to have churches, spiritualist churches. And in Chattanooga, I'm having to say Chattanooga, I know all that history down there, but um, they had a huge spiritualist church. And it was uh, on, uh, I think it was uh, Lookout Mountain. And there was a natural bridge, and they bought it, this property. And they would have seances on this natural bridge, which overlooked a, a beautiful waterfall. It's still a park. You can go to it. Gorgeous. Uh, and they would have seances with over a 1,000 people at a time, if you can imagine. 
and they would have like festive, you know, festivities, and you could go at different times to go there and and see all these famous psychics from around the country, mingle with other psychics, get in groups, do tent revival kind of things, and it was a very actually a very positive thing. But of course, with every spiritual movement, every belief system, you're going to have beautiful, wonderful believers who are 100% innocent coming to it wide-eyed. And then you're also going to have people go, oh, I want a slice of that and get into it and use tricks and tarnish it, you know, use it for ill-gotten gains kind of thing. So you have really good psychics and you have psychics who are skanks. But you have that with every religion. You have uh, Baptists that are great, Baptists that are not, Christians that are great, Christians that are not, Jews that are great, Jews that are not, uh, you know, any of it. You know, there's always somebody in each belief system that, you know, you're going to have somebody in it for other purposes than the spirituality. Uh, Because in my family, other spiritualities, you know, we had um, a little mixture. There were there were some relatives who were Jewish. We also had, but they came from a very bad. uh, They had to escape Europe, you know, to get away from that. Back in the 1800s, way before the 19 1940s, Uh, and also we had um, my great. Great grandfather on my father's side was an Apache, so they had their own spirituality, you know. And uh, so every every belief system has its great people and its not so great people. And with the psychic community, um, you had charlatans and you had real believers. And the charlatans are the ones they look at a lot, you know, to go, look at this, look at this. But, you know, but there were a lot of people who were good psychics in doing. And when I'm saying, you know, that different religions, I mean, because everybody, you know, there's Catholic, anything, and not just different races of people. Everybody has some great people, not so great people. And in metaphysics, there are some great people. And then there's some you're like, really? Give me a stick. I'm going to chase them. And I run into that all the time because I, I really feel like when you're dealing with somebody spiritually, you need to be honest and you need to be doing the best work you can for them. And then when I see people playing little tricks, little psychological tricks and stuff to get readings out of people that they're leading them. Because to me, the way I was trained is, don't tell me what you want to hear. Don't tell me what you're wanting to look at. Let me tell you what I see. Then we'll address any other questions. But let me tell you what I see first. And when you do that, you have no information. You know if you're hitting it. And a lot of spiritualists are like that. You know, it wasn't, you know, cold readings. They were, you know, let it, this is what the spirits are telling me. This is what I'm telling you. And when you do it that way, then you get a much better response and a much more dramatic response. But uh, but the spiritualist movement was so big. And then it was huge in the late 1800s. Um, the... Fox sisters, uh, all of them died before 1893. They all died, the three of them. And there's a lot of controversy with them and all this stuff. But whatever happened with them, it ignited this movement. And in the late 1800s, in the 1890s, I think it was hitting like a, like a, in 1897, I think they said they thought there were maybe. 8 million spiritualists, and that's just what they know, what they knew. I mean, that doesn't cover the little 
mountain grannies who were doing all this stuff at home, who were doing their, every little mountain granny knew how to do a table tipping. Every little mountain granny knew how to um, do levitation, you know, uh, and a lot of it was, you know, what I call metaphysics, you know, I mean, uh, the science of the, of metaphysics and, um, they had their own way of doing it and it became so popular and so easy to do that it fell out of, out of mode after a while. Cause everybody could do it. If everybody could do it, it wasn't special. And uh, after the Fox sisters had died, because there was a lot of uh, things about them, and I won't get into all of it because that's a whole nother other show. Um, they had been disgraced basically at the end because uh, they were all poor, and I think one of them was very alcoholic, and they had um, fallen out of favor. And they were bitter, and they also, you know, were trying to make money. And uh, they just, um, it it was something that moved on beyond them. And so, you know, to have 8 million people following this and creating this and making making campgrounds and making churches, they ignited something that grew bigger than they were. And the, after they had died, in the early 1900s, the house that they had lived in that had the split, Mr. Splitfoot, the spirit that would talk to them, some kids were playing in the abandoned house's basement and a wall fell on one of them. So they had to be dug out. And when they did, they found a skeleton or bones and they found uh, a peddler's metal box. So they said that was, you know, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle said, um, you know, that was proof that that spirit was in that house because the neighbors had thought there was a man who had just feared it might be his ghost. And so he apparently, if it was true, then the guy was murdered, buried in the basement. And that's what the girls were talking to. But it happened after their death. So they weren't able to benefit from that. But it, it was kind of like, oh, well, so there was something to it. And so that was interesting. Um, and where I come from, the spiritualists, there's a big spiritualist camp, like I told you, and everything. But along with all this other stuff, when you had the the spiritualist movement going on and all this, you also had the growth of the KKK. And where I came from, the KKK basically chased off all of the spiritualists because they, you know, it, it was something they couldn't control. Um, and they just demonized it and chased people off. And of course they were known for, you know, hurting people and doing things at that time. I'm sure there were KKK members who jumped, but these people did. And they chased them out of town on a, on a rail. And, um, in the twenties, 1926 to be exact. There were some spiritualist women who were rich ladies, and they began um, uh, a new thing, trying to renew it in Chattanooga. So right now we've got to go to a break. I will be back in just a minute. Uh, so. All of you out there in the dark, don't touch that dial. You are listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting, the best in paranormal talk, only on Paranormal Experience Radio, broadcasting live out of Birmingham, Alabama. Oh, come on. I'm Southern, but... Um, nope. 
That'll do. Hello. I am Kat Hobson, host of Paranormal Experience here on WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. I enjoy having guests from all areas of the paranormal, from ghosts to ufology to cryptids and beyond. You'll find some of the best researchers in their fields bringing you some great information. Join me on Wednesday nights from 8 to 10 p. Eastern here on WBHM Digital Broadcasting. Since 1948, Fate Magazine has brought you reports of the strange and unknown, all of them true. Fate Radio is carrying on that tradition, bringing you the unusual, macabre, strange, and bizarre. Join host Cat Hops Sunday nights from 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern on WBHM Digital Broadcast. Listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting, the best in paranormal talk, only on Paranormal Experienced Radio, broadcasting live out of Birmingham, Alabama. Welcome back to Universal Truths with Mark Fultz, coming to you from WBHM TV in Birmingham, Alabama, and coming to you from my cute little tiny house near Pensacola. And we are talking about spiritualism and Mary Todd Lincoln and her influence in the spiritualist uh, movement in, in the White House. So... Everybody probably had ancestors who were part of the spiritualist movement, and it didn't matter. Uh, people from all walks of life, uh, whether it be you know Christian or Jewish or you know um, Baptist, Catholic, for some reason there were people from all walks of life who secretly and openly were being psychics and being led by God and, and, and uh, talking to people and doing things in a healthy way of, of, of trying to be helpful. And uh, it just, and a few years ago, I didn't know this until just about three years ago, my mother's father's grandmother, her name was Louisiana Jefferson Mosley Swearingen. And she was a spiritualist. And how did we find that out? Well, apparently, her husband, my great-great-grandfather, um, was a worked in, owned a, a shoe shop, basically. You know, and back then, you know, you had to make your own shoes and things. And when he was 50, he walked in one day, sat down, and said, I'm not doing this anymore. I'm tired. I'm retired. So they needed an income. So guess what? Louisiana Jefferson Mosley Swearingen was a psychic. So she put out her sign and she made a living. And the only, you know, the their um, grandchildren apparently talked about they would test her and they would hide things and see if she could tell them what it was and they she, without fail they were never able to trip her up so she was a good psychic and my mother's mother was a very big psychic i mean you know just natural and uh, she had incredible psychic experiences that impressed me as a child and um just, you know, and she was from the late 1800s, so her mother and all of them were sort of into it, and she was extremely psychic. And then in, in my mother's family, they believed in the psychic thing, but then they also, because my mother's father was, uh, you know, he, he was against all of it, but he was in, you know, he was, uh, so they poo-pooed that, so they had to tamp it down some. But my grandmother was a great psychic. And uh, then when it came to me and I was a psychic, 
you know, they looked at me through the lens of um, a very strict Christian thing, you know, saying, well, that's bad. That means you're bad. You're a devil worshiper, which is not psychic abilities are not devil stuff. That is God given tools. And, you know, the devil belongs to somebody else. That's something they, they get. They, they, every time somebody says the devil did made you do it, they're giving the devil power. Uh, and I'm not a devil worshiper. <laughs> I'm a positive worshiper. I'm a positive earth person. And I just believe that this is part of my God given gift. And that's why and my, my grandmother and my great great grandmother, they did what was natural. They were being natural and the spiritualism that gave them that. And it was huge movement. And then it did get tampered down by the churches and stuff starting to go after it in Chattanooga. There was a country club in 1926 that um, actually in August 25th to, in 1926, uh, these seven rich women were at this country club and they rented the tower room and they were doing seancing and stuff. They were trying to, in their own way, get the spiritualist movement starting back up. And some of these KKK members knew they were doing that. They had been tipped off. So they went up there, cut these women's throats, stacked them up like cordwood, and said, the devil must have done it. And that stopped the spiritualist movement in Chattanooga. But before then, you know, there were all these psychics and stuff. I have articles, article, articles, having seances in the big uh, hotels and, and at doctors doing it and lawyers and judges having seances. And, you know, it, it, it was just interesting. And then it, it turned mostly when uh, Howard, Hud I mean, well, Houdini, I can't think of it. I want to call him Howard Houdini. Uh, but uh, Mr. Houdini, the magician, he was fascinated with it, but when he found out he couldn't do it, and he couldn't really find a, a psychic that impressed him enough, he went on a tirade to destroy psychics. And later on, they have said, and allegedly, that if he couldn't find evidence against someone that he would plant evidence so and i kind of believe that because he wanted to have the psychic experience and was frustrated because he couldn't and actually when he died he had made an, a, a, a thing with his wife if it, it tried to communicate with me tried to do a seance and nobody was able to do it or if they did you know who knows um but he went on a, a very damaging anti-psychic thing, and it hurt the spiritualist movement and kind of broke it. And then uh, it still exists. I mean, there are still churches and stuff, but they're very private. And it's a whole different thing than what they were doing in the 1800s. I'm kind of like an 1800s spiritualist roots. Uh, so what I do goes back to the older stuff, not, you know, the the, the ultralight, you know, dietary, <laughs> you know, new, modern, you know, like, you know, Coke, Coke Zero. Uh, I'm into the Coke. I'm in, uh, the, the Coca-Cola, you know, the old Coca-Cola. I'm into the old spiritualism. And it benefits and hooves me well because... Uh, I talk to people's spirits all the time. I help people with their grief. I help people in ways that they weren't even expecting sometimes, or I wasn't expecting. Sometimes it takes me by surprise, some of the things that come out of my mouth that I didn't know. It's their information. And to... um you know, I mean, I, I, one very interesting thing I remember years ago, back in 99, 
when I was working at Stonehenge Metaphysical Bookstore in Chattanooga um, by Wilma Tucker. And uh, there was this girl came in, and she heard I had just done a seance the night before. And she came to me, and she says, I need that. And I said, all right. I said, everybody, let's let the store clear, and then I'll sit and I'll, I'll do it for you. And she said, great. So everybody left, and she sat down. I didn't know anything about her. I said, don't tell me anything. And I did my spiritual stuff connecting in, and I could see this man. He had no shirt on. It looked like he was swimming. It looked like a pond, but there was like fog all around him. And I said, this man looks like he's swimming or, you know, going to swim. And she screamed like I had shot her. And what had happened? Her husband was going to teach her to swim. So he took her out privately and they went to a little pond and or they swam out to the center and he was teaching her to swim. He had a heart attack and died immediately. And he slipped away from her under the water. She didn't know how to swim. She had to swim all the way to the shore. And she was traumatized because this man, you know, this had happened. And uh, the spirit was there. And he looked like he was swimming. I said, you know, he's right there. So I told her he was so sorry. He said, I didn't know that was going to happen. I didn't mean for it to traumatize you. And we were able to work it out. And her friends later on came by and said they'd never seen her so happy because it had lifted a huge weight because she felt guilty. He died trying to teach her to swim and it released her. But boy, when she screamed, <laughs> scared me out of three lives, but that's how it happened. You never know how it's going to happen. And uh, like I said, when you go to a psychic though, make sure you're getting the right thing that you're getting the real psychic. And if you have someone there and they're charging a fee, which is normal, I mean, they have to make, they have to make a living too, but make sure the fee is nominal, you know, minimal, uh, for what it is. Or, you know, I mean, some people charge a lot of money and then some don't, but if they start going into other things like, you know, bring me $300 and I'll do this, or, you know, bring me a bag with money or, you know, come to me every month and I'll fix all your problems. You know, don't do that, but make sure they're connecting to you and make sure that what they're telling you is connecting in at some point. Some, and some people, you have a bad day and they may be a great psychic, you know, but you know, you, they're having to deal with you and these other people and they're in a store setting or they're in a, another, you know, so you have to sometimes, sometimes readings take a weird thing and you have to restart. But usually a good psychic can shake it off, make it work. So try to always find somebody who's real. And if they start trying to gouge you for money after the reading or during the reading or trying to get more and more and more and more and more, uh, get up and leave. You know, it shouldn't be an outrageous fortune. I know that there are some famous ones that charge fortunes. There was a very famous one who's deceased now, um, who was like, you know, $5,000 to talk to you. And you, and toward the end of her life, they were doing things that were not so great. Their, their talent had gone downhill because they were having health problems. And the psychic should know when they should stop or when they should take a break. And if they're damaged and they're sick and they're doing terrible readings, but they're still grabbing that money, then, you know, don't, don't do that. You know, go to someone else that, you know, because sometimes uh, we're under 
having to deal with our health and and sometimes people have real talent but sometimes it gets affected so and if it does you know go to someone else um and the socket may have just had a bad day and then again you have socket to nail it and <clears throat> just go to them i'm actually saving up uh information and everything to um show people to show proof and get affidavits and, and uh, testimonials because um, that's what people look at to see. Because if you don't, then it's just your word. And so you have to build up information. But we are at the top of the hour. I have to take a break. But I will be back shortly. We're going to, and we will go into Mary Todd Lincoln because she's a fascinating story. So all of you out there in the dark, don't touch that dial. We'll be right back. Live from NPR News, I'm Janine Herbst. At a hearing today, a federal magistrate judge ruled that the government must provide the court a redacted version of the affidavit justifying last week's search of former President Donald Trump's South Florida estate. It's a sign that the currently sealed document could soon be released in some form. And Pierce Greg Allen was in the courtroom in West Palm Beach today and has more on what's next. The government has until next Thursday at noon to submit a redacted affidavit to the judge and if he agrees with their redactions, he could just sign an order and release it fairly soon, maybe as early as next week. But if, as seems likely, there is some disagreement between the judge and the government on the redactions, that could begin a back and forth between the government and the judge. It all could take some time. And then if the government ultimately disagrees with what the judge rules, it may appeal the decision. NPR's Greg Allen. Kentucky's near total ban on abortions will remain in effect after the state's Supreme Court denied a request to block the measure. Kentucky Public Radio's Ryland Barton reports a legal challenge against the ban continues. Kentucky's trigger law bans all abortions in the state except in cases when a patient's life is at risk. The state's two abortion providers sued over the law, and while a lower court initially blocked the ban, appeals courts have allowed it to be enforced while it makes its way through the legal system. The state Supreme Court did set a date when it'll hear arguments over the case, November 15th, a week after Election Day. That's when Kentuckians will weigh in on an anti-abortion amendment to the state constitution. For NPR News, I'm Ryland Barton in Louisville. A federal appeals court has denied a request by oil and gas companies to move lawsuits filed by the city of Hoboken, New Jersey, and the state of Delaware to federal court. NPR's Laura Benchoff reports it's the latest win for states and cities suing fossil fuel companies over damage caused by climate change. The city of Hoboken and state of Delaware say they are uniquely affected by sea level rise and flooding caused by climate change. So a couple years ago, they sued fossil fuel companies who they say knowingly contributed to it to try to get them to pay for expensive climate resilience projects. Oil and gas companies tried to get those cases moved to federal court where they might get a better outcome, arguing that their drilling activities were permitted under federal regulations. A three-judge panel sided against those companies, ruling this week that the two cases could proceed in state courts. Nearly 20 similar suits are filed around the country, from South Carolina to California. Laura Benshoff, NPR News. Fewer people filed for unemployment benefits last week as the labor market continues to be the strongest segment of the U.S. economy. The Labor Department says first-time jobless claims fell 2,000 to a seasonally adjusted 250,000. The less volatile four-week average fell by 2,750 to 246,750. This is NPR. In Germany, Chancellor Olaf Scholz says the government will temporarily lower taxes on natural gas to ease the financial pressure on people struggling with soaring energy costs from Russia's war with Ukraine. This comes a day after Scholz met with hostile protesters during a town hall event outside the capital. And consumers will also have to pay a new surcharge to prop up energy companies scrambling to find new supplies on the global market. 
NFL quarterback Deshaun Watson of the Cleveland Browns has been suspended for the first 11 games of the upcoming regular season and fined $5 million. The punishment increases his original six-game suspension, which the NFL appealed, after more than 20 massage therapists accused him of sexual misconduct. NPR's Tom Goldman has more. Deshaun Watson's 11-game suspension falls short of the season-long ban the NFL wanted. Still, League Commissioner Roger Goodell says the 11 games are more substantial than the original six-game ban, and the $5 million fine is significant. Watson recently signed with Cleveland for a guaranteed $230 million. The settlement also requires Watson to undergo evaluation and treatment. Watson was never criminally charged, and he continues to maintain his innocence. He told reporters his recent public apology was because a lot of people were, quote, triggered. Watson settled civil suits with all but one of the roughly two dozen women who accused him of sexual assault and misconduct during massage sessions. Tom Goldman, NPR News. U.S. futures contracts are trading flat at this hour. I'm Janine Herbst, NPR News. We all have moments where our limits are tested. What I want to talk about is how we define those limits and what it means to exceed them. I'm Jay Williams. Check out my show, The Limits, where I talk to people who have overcome theirs and achieved great things in business, sports, and culture. Listen to The Limits from NPR. Welcome back to Universal Truths with Mark Fultz, coming to you from WBHMDB in beautiful Birmingham, Alabama. And I'm coming to you from my sweet little tiny house near Pitscola, here living in vacation land. Well, we are talking tonight about spiritualism. Now we're going to start talking about one of the saddest political figures, couples really, actually, in our history, which is Abraham Lincoln and Mary Todd Lincoln. And Pitiful doesn't begin to describe it. Um, You know, poor little... Abraham was raised, um, he, his mother had been, um, became pregnant by one of her, the man she worked for. He sold her off, basically married her off to this guy who ended up being Abraham Lincoln's uh, father. And uh, he loved his mother, and uh, but she died early. He was he really he had a terrible time. Uh, his mother died early. He had a stepmother, I think, that he loved very much. Uh, he is apparently very a very loving person and very gawky. And you know, he they thought he might have Marfans, which I have, which is makes you very tall and gangly. And he was just a very tall, gangly, strange young man who was turned out to be one of a brilliant mind, uh, who really came from nothing. He really came from nothing. And he lost, like I said, he lost his mother. He, which Mary Todd Lincoln did too. She lost her mother early. And then he was in love with a young lady that died and they said he would just get so depressed especially when it would rain he would think he would say it would depress him to think about the water raining down and getting her wet in her grave you know and I thought that's pretty depressed and uh, when he met Mary Todd Lincoln now she came from a very well to do family and she was very she was raised by people who were into politics and unlike a lot of women because at that time if you were uh, a well-to-do white woman you were meant to just get married marry well and you know that was your have babies and that was your life you know and have your nannies raise everybody and then you go and be elegant and and then at some point you die and that's a successful life, you know, for a woman back then. And, uh, you know, and I, even up until the 60s, 
Uh, I know I've said it in my other shows before, but it's true because girls were expected to, you know, they would make trousseaus. My mother put a trousseau together for my sister when she was 10 years old, going, when you get married, you'll need this stuff. So that uh, she made her a cedar chest. And nobody does that anymore, thank goodness, in a way, because in a way it was cool because you would get, you know, your ancestral, you know, antiques and things. But it also was just about you're a girl. This is all you're meant to be. Your goal in life is to get married. But Mary Todd Lincoln could hold her own at the table. She was very politically savvy. And she was very intelligent. And things that happened later in her life, we also believe she was very bipolar. Um, And bipolar people are actually can be very, very intelligent. Um, Now we have so many medicines that help that, that. But back then, there was nothing. The only really painkiller they had was morphine or cocaine, you know, kind of stuff. Um, And you could get morphine through the Sears and Roebuck book for a long time. And uh, with a syringe, you know, I'm like, uh. Um, But she was actually very intelligent. And when she met... Lincoln, I think she saw this diamond in the rough. And we really, I don't think, would have gotten the Lincoln that we got if it weren't for Mary Todd Lincoln. Uh, She pushed him. And when she pushed him and was, you know, gave him some some support, uh, he did blossom in that department. I think. And a lot of people don't think to think that because history has demonized her a little bit. (laughs) But in the beginning, I think she was a good support for him. And when they got married, um, they ended up having four children. Now, she had uh, Robert, who was much older than the other three, I think. I think he was into teenagehood when the other ones were born, or he was even maybe um, an adult. I can't remember, but I know he was older. And then uh, she had Eddie and Willie and then Tad. And they were apparently thrilled with their children, especially the really young ones. They just loved them. And before he got into office, Eddie died when he was four years old um, and that was just terribly devastating I mean you know it's one it's one thing to miscarriage it's another thing to have a baby and be attached to the baby and the baby dies then you have a child who's already gotten to four years old and they're talking and you're connected with them and never and that It's just so devastating for anyone to lose a baby or a child. I mean, to lose a child. It just, I can't imagine. But, you know, they got through that devastating part of their life. And he gets elected. And... While he's in office in 1862, during the war, I believe, um, Willie got typhoid, and he was 11 years old, and he died in the White House. And that's when Mary Todd had been interested in spiritualism, but when Willie died, She really got into it heavy, and it was the only thing that gave her comfort because she just became so depressed, and it really also, I think, kicked in her bipolar uh, tendencies, which when you have bipolar, sometimes you're you're an extravagant spender. 
even though you don't have money to spend. And she became an extravagant spender that stressed Abraham out because he didn't have a, they, he got an income as president, but it's not like today. And he had a little income, but she made him a pauper while they were in there because she couldn't stop spending. And actually, when he was reelected, she was real relieved because she knew that if he hadn't been reelected, they would have been in trouble because she had gotten him into a lot of debt. So he, she was able to pay those debts off because he got a better salary. He got the money, so she paid off the debts that she had run up to that point. And that she became huge into spiritualism. And she, she did it as a coping mechanism to talk to uh, Eddie and Willie. And she got to where she would just tell people, well, Eddie and Willie are alive. They come to me at night and they stand there and smile at me. Sometimes Willie just comes by himself and sometimes Eddie comes. And to her, it was it was real. And they were uh, really talking to the spirits. So she actually had her spiritualist friends come and they believe she had about eight seances they know of in the red room. And Abraham came to several of those to appease her because he knew it was the only thing that made her happy. And he was busy having to uh, do the war, trying to get the country through this and losing his children and uh, going through devastating depression. He was he was pitiful, really. When he would be out visiting the camps, the, the camps and stuff like that, and going seeing the soldiers, when they would put him out to sleep, he would ask for and get. They would give a soldier to him to sleep with him because in the old days when he was young he used to sleep with his brothers and not sleep in the you know naughty sense to he just needed company and so they would have soldiers they would assign to him to give him comfort because he was so insecure lonely depressed he had the war going on that was a huge and he took it very seriously. He did not do it like the ones nowadays, you know, that are kind of devoid of it. They don't know. He was out in the trenches watching this stuff. And he was very depressed. And on top of it, he had a, a wife who there was no medications for her depression. And he was depressed and she was more depressed. And they had one young son living with him, Tad, and, you know, she just became, what do you call it, a kind of a hypochondriac towards him, you know, well, the other ones die, you're going to die, you're going to die, and actually, after everything happened with Abraham, uh, when Tad was 18, he died from tuberculosis, I believe. Or, and um, he was panicking because he couldn't breathe. And so he died terrified, which that sent her over whatever edge there was left. And, of course, you know, when she was with her, with Abraham before all of that, um, Abraham had a premonition he was going to be killed. You know, he had that big dream where he went into a stateroom and he could hear crying and he saw a coffin and he said, someone, he said, what's happened? And someone told him the president has been assassinated. And now it's like, you know, a few weeks before his assassination. Um, and then when 
Mary Todd Lincoln was sitting next to him. And that night she had had a premonition and said, maybe we should not go. And he went, no, we need to go. He needed to get out. He needed to relax. And she was sitting right next to him when he was shot. And we're going to have to go to a commercial. But when we come back, we're going to continue about Mary Todd Lincoln and her spiritualism. So you out there in the dark, don't touch that dial. We'll be right back. You are listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting, Birmingham, Alabama. Paratalk Radio is your one stop for all things paranormal, the unknown, and the supernatural. Join us every Monday night at 8 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Central for discussions and guests on topics such as ghosts, hauntings, Bigfoot, UFOs, and more. This broadcast is rated M for mature and intended for listeners over 16 on paratalkradio.com. Oh, come on. I'm Southern, but... Um, nope. That'll do. Hello. I am Kat Hobson, host of Paranormal Experience here on WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. I enjoy having guests from all areas of the paranormal, from ghosts to ufology to cryptids and beyond. You'll find some of the best researchers in their fields bringing you some great information. Join me on Wednesday nights from 8 to 10 p. Eastern here on WBHM Digital Broadcasting. Since 1948, Fate Magazine has brought you reports of the strange and unknown, all of them true. Fate Radio is carrying on that tradition, bringing you the unusual, macabre, strange, and bizarre. Join host Cat Hopson Sunday nights from 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern on WBHM Digital Broadcasting. Thank you for listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. Since 1948, Fate Magazine has brought you reports of the strange and unknown, all of them true. Fate Radio is carrying on that tradition, bringing you the unusual, macabre, strange, and bizarre. Join host Cat Hops Sunday nights from 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern on WBHM Digital Broadcast. The time is 23 minutes after the hour. Welcome back to Universal Truths with Mark Fultz coming to you from WBHM DB in beautiful Birmingham, Alabama. And I'm coming to you from my sweet little tiny home in Pensacola, Florida. Now, we are talking about Mary Todd Lincoln and Abraham Lincoln. And when I finished the last segment, she she was sitting next to Abraham. She had lost two of her children. She had lost her mother. She was was losing uncles and things like that, very close people during the war. And then she's sitting next to her husband that she had had a premonition about, and he gets shot in front of her. And so she loses what mind she has, of course. And they actually, when he, he lived for, I think, until the next day. So they took him to a room. They had to remove her because she was just so distraught. And they finally brought her back in right before Abraham died. 
And actually, I remember reading something where um, just as he started to die, his face, he got a, a very sweet smile, relaxed. He got a relaxed smile on his face. And they said they had, had not seen him that relaxed in years. And he smiled, and then he died, which I've experienced that. I know people who've died with smiles on their face, and that's because um, going through the death process before the near-death process, it's you are so happy when you start seeing these people, and they're calling you, and you're feeling it. And two, the hypothalamus produces a chemical to help you in the death process, and it's uh, oxytocin. And it's uh, it, in cats, you know, it, it makes cats bond with their kittens, with people. It helps you bond with your baby. You get this love, 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 love feeling. So when you're dying, the hypothalamus is releasing this, this chemical, oxytocin, and you're, you're seeing the people, you're relaxing, and then you go. And so he died with a smile on his face. And, but then, you know, they took his body. Embalming was new. They embalmed him. They put him on a train and took him on around the country kind of trip. And people got to see him so that he was, the whole way he went, there was an embalmer that was with him the whole way. And he would change his clothes and put more embalming fluid in. So by the time he was finished on the trip, he was totally 100% embalmed. And uh, during this process, Mary Todd couldn't go to the funeral. She stayed in bed, and she had a psychic come and the psychic sat by the bed doing seancing around the clock so she could talk to her husband. And she didn't go to the funeral. She didn't go to any of the things that happened. She stayed at home mourning. And actually, they were having a hard time getting her out of the White House because they had to change, get her out, you know, because it, it, it's like when John F. Kennedy died. You know, the um, Lyndon Johnson stood in. So within a day or two, the you know Jacqueline Kennedy, Jacqueline Kennedy had to leave the White House. So they gave her several weeks. I think she had like a month. It took a month for her to get herself together to leave the White House. And when she did, she kind of did it at night. And she took about 60 trunks worth of stuff because when she was buying all this stuff with the money Abraham Lincoln was making, you know, she had bought china and silver and all this great fabrics and things like that. And so she wasn't going to leave that stuff. And they were so ready to get rid of her because they hated her in Washington. They didn't know how to deal with her. And so they just they just were ready for her to leave. So when she left by a you know under the cover of night, she took all these trunks with her, which I thought was kind of funny. Uh, but uh, in let me see, she in 1875, her oldest son Robert had her institutionalized for a while because she really really went over the edge for a while. And then when she got kind of straightened out a little, she went and lived with her sister. And her niece, I remember reading in a book that I'd given a friend of mine years ago, um, had a great big book about Lincoln. It was fascinating. And she, um, the niece said, the trunks, they put all the trunks in the attic. And there were so many of them that, the attic floor began to bow and the last few years of her life, she said that all that Mary Todd was interested in 
in the daytime, she would go up there and just look through the things in her trunk. She'd sit there all day long surrounded by this finery from her past. Um, after uh, Abraham died, then, of course, you know, Tad died uh, at 18, just a boy. And she just had nothing to take a hold of. And there was no medicine. There were no treatments. And if you were mentally challenged because of your chemistry or whatever or mentality, they blamed you for it. And it's like, no, people who are bipolar, that is a disorder. And, uh, and it's, you know, it's not comfortable and happy kind of thing. And she wasn't, she left, lived the last of her life. Uh, she wasn't close to her oldest son. The sons that she was close to were all dead. There were quite a few people in her family that she loved that were all dead. And she just went on until she died. Now, some other weird things that kind of happened when Lincoln had died, someone, there were a group of men tried to steal his body. So they didn't succeed, but the people in charge of, you know, watching the body and watching, you know, the property, they hid Lincoln's body for 20 years. And, um, they couldn't quit going back, and the son Robert knew about it. But these people couldn't quit going and looking at Lincoln, and they'd open his casket, look at him. And he was so preserved because of the embalming fluid, which was new. Uh, you know, there was something to look at. And actually, the last one, when they, when Robert had the final monument made to bury his father um when mary todd lincoln died they acted like they put her body with him in the mausoleum that had been broken into at that time well they hid her body with his so they were not on view and so they were hidden in a place that you know wherever they had them and so the last time, which was actually almost 1900, uh, I keep saying 20 years, but eh, it might have been. It was it was close to in the 1890s, 1900. It's been a long time since I read that story, but it was at least 20 years past him being dead. And they did one last view. They cut into the leather, the um, lead casket that was over his regular casket and uh, to keep the body in shape and they peeled back a piece of it and looked at him and he had turned totally white his uh, they said the hair the black hair was there but his eyebrows had fallen off because you lose your hair and stuff like that um uh but he just looked like a statue he looked like a white piece of statue marble and uh, but they looked at the president and Robert, his oldest son, was like, "Stop doing that, you know." So when they buried him for the final time, they it, Robert had them pour uh, concrete on top of it so no one could ever bother his father again. And I know with um, Lincoln, when um, Willie died. He couldn't quit going uh, opening casket for Willie, and even when they put him in the tomb, he kept going to the tomb and opening the casket for a while because he just couldn't let him go. And I thought, and then they did that to Lincoln. They didn't; these people loved Lincoln so much they didn't, they couldn't let him go. And in the White House, of course, he haunts the White House, which I think it's his personality because. Your your spirit is what you create, and when you die, your spirit and your soul go on. Sometimes if someone haunts, it's the spirit or it's the personality. 
because it has its own consciousness. You know, it's um, it's you're, you know, it's very complicated, but it's, it's once you've created the spirit, your personality, who you are, can be very its own consciousness. So in the White House, they've had hauntings where, you know, Lincoln will walk down the hallway and knock on the door to his old bedroom or go and knock on people's doors. Uh, People have seen him laying in the floor crying in total despair. That's probably when his child died, Willie. Uh, I haven't heard about Mary Todd Lincoln haunting, but he haunts. And I thought, well, the worst parts of his life, there were some really terrible things happening on in that White House. It was not a great experience for him. So, of course, he would haunt. Uh, but I think it's his personality haunting. I think the spirit was happy and went on. And, um, of course, nobody sends on the ghost in the White House, so he haunts the White House. Uh, and Mary Todd Lincoln, um, when she died, you know, that just, they never had a good thing to say about her. Because when she was in the the White House with Abraham Lincoln, she also, she was very outspoken. And she would uh, stand up for her husband. And she would, uh, and she knew politics. And she could take those politicians and turn them inside out, you know, like a pillowcase. And they didn't like her. They didn't like women having an opinion they still don't (laughs) you know strong women if you're a man and you have a strong opinion you're you know you're respected if it's a woman then you're a witch with a bee and uh and she could be right you know but they didn't like her so history hasn't treated her well and but if you think about it she just had one trauma one trauma one trauma after the other and who's to say, I mean, would you be able to keep your mind if you lost three of your children and your husband and your husband being shot in front of you? I I just don't know very many people who could keep their marbles. And um, she just was pitiful. He was pitiful. And, uh, you know, and he did. I think he did the right things for the country. He tried. Uh, There were things that, you know, I probably wouldn't agree with, and there are some things I do agree with. Uh, I think he did what was right in the way of, you know, stopping slavery, you know, but he died for it. And uh, so he just had, and I think he knew it would happen. He just knew it would happen. And, uh, but he just was a pitiful character. And, um, so was she. And actually, I own a piece of one of her dresses. Uh, one day I'm going to do a channeling and I'm going to channel her and see what condition she's in. If, if she transitioned and her spirit went on or if she's having issues because she was so, Sometimes you get discarnate people because they cannot let go of the sorrow and they can't look forward and go towards the ones they love because they're still going, but, but, you know, so we'll check on her at some point. Uh, But she is, um, I think they need to do a good movie about her, not just him, her, because she... There, I don't think there's any other first lady who went through what she went through and and for it to be happening and for her husband to in her depression and his depression and he was the war was going on and he couldn't give her attention like she needed and she worried about him and she worried about her children and she worried about you know, uh, she became so um, afraid and so sad, and uh, and she had all these problems, you know, because um, 
there were several times, you know, she could have ruined him just because they could not stop her from secretly spending money. And she couldn't stop that. That's because of the bipolar. And that adds another layer of guilt and another layer of guilt on him because he couldn't stop her. And, well, how do you deal with it? You know, and he did, he couldn't deal with her and the country and the war. And, you know, and he, he really seriously, I think, took the deaths of the, the um, Americans. He took it seriously. He didn't go, oh, you know, like a rich person going, oh, you know, well, whatever. He really took that. And actually, one thing that they believe started it, where he really was against the slavery, which goody, uh, thank God he was, uh, he went to a house called the Crenshaw House in Kentucky. And they had uh, a beautiful house, blah, 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 but the third floor they used for their slaves. And he was so appalled at that they believe he went there for a visit and it, they believe that's where he really changed and and really went, you know, we have to change this. But again, you know, he sacrificed his life for the end. And um, he didn't have happiness. But, uh, but I think it's so fascinating that she... was a spiritualist and brought seances into the White House in the Red Room. I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall in the Red Room when she would be doing seances. I bet they were with current, you know, first-generation spiritualists. I can't imagine what those seances were like. They had to be blow the roof off. But like I said, he and Abraham knew that that gave her comfort and he went to some of them and that's just something that you wouldn't see today you know they wouldn't be able to do that today and um i just think it's fascinating part of our country and it went the and spiritualism was so popular here it is it was in the white house at at, at the uh in the seat of our country basically and um uh, just fascinating. Just fascinating. And I would like to see some movement like that again, you know, where we have spiritual happiness, uh, non hate towards other people, working towards uh, the goal of, of, of spiritual alignment. And um, it just is, um, I would like to see that movement. I would like to see something like that. Something that's not, you're bad, we're good. Um, let's help each other develop. Let's speak to our spirits. Let's speak to our ancestors. Let's make the world a little bit easier for the next people coming along. And uh, I hope one day we'll have that movement. I hope I get to see it because uh, everything keeps coming around. We still have spiritualist stuff here. We have psychics talking to you right now. So, And I'm a direct descendant from the spiritualist movement itself. So it's still around us. It's still an important thing to me. So, um, And hopefully one day you can uh, experience it in a positive way. Now, we're going to have to go to a break. I will be back to finish up the show here in just a few minutes. So, all of you out there in the dark, don't touch that dial. We'll be right back. You are listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting, the best in paranormal talk, only on Paranormal Experience Radio, broadcasting live out of Birmingham, Alabama.
Oh, come on. I'm Southern, but... Um, nope. That'll do. Hello. I am Kat Hobson, host of Paranormal Experience here on WBHN Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. I enjoy having guests from all areas of the paranormal, from ghosts to ufology to cryptids and beyond. You'll find some of the best researchers in their fields bringing you some great information. Join me on Wednesday nights from 8 to 10 p. Eastern here on WBHM Digital Broadcasting. Since 1948, Fate Magazine has brought you reports of the strange and unknown, all of them true. Fate Radio is carrying on that tradition, bringing you the unusual, macabre, strange, and bizarre. Join host Cat Hops Sunday nights from 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern on WBHM Digital Broadcasting. Listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting, the best in paranormal talk, only on Paranormal Experienced Radio, broadcasting live out of Birmingham, Alabama. Welcome back to Universal Truths with Mark Fultz coming to you from WBHM TV in beautiful Birmingham, Alabama, coming to you from my sweet little house in near Pensacola, Florida. And we're getting close to the end of the show. Um, I hope that you enjoyed this information about Abraham Lincoln and Mary Todd Lincoln and the spiritualist movement, which uh, like I said, every time I go to work, I'm using spiritualist techniques, and I've created my own line of, of communication boards and, and things like that. And people, when they go, oh, a widget board, I don't have widget boards. I have spirit boards, which are charged. Uh, the, I did charge the ink. I charge the paper. I draw the artwork. I, I cleanse the board. I apply the the artwork, I do a week's worth of energy work on it, then I use it as my communication device. Now, Ouija boards do work, and they do, they are kind of, they are a offshoot of the spiritualist movement. It's a spiritualist, it's something to help you talk to spirits, and it works. But the thing is, you have to think about it. It's an uncleansed board, and you just get it in a box. People put it down. They put their fingers on that planchette, and they go, is there somebody out there? They haven't cleansed it. They haven't done any prayers. They haven't done any energy work. And then you're calling in a spirit. And if you, a lot of people forget to close it. They don't take it seriously, and they open up, and they call to the dead, and they don't close it. So then they have issues and problems because it is a toy. You don't even need that to call a spirit. And uh, so, you know, you have to always learn proper techniques. And so if you do Ouija boards or you do spirit boards or you do table tipping or you do um, levitation techniques, uh, which is some kind of physics, really. I don't know how to explain it, but I had... uh, uh, a person I knew that was real big in this stuff. He, you know, explained it, the physics to me, but I was too young and dumb to know how to process it. Uh, but if you do these things, do it with respect. Do, do it with um, prayer, energy work, clean your tools, clean the table with vinegar, anything that, you know, don't just go in and go, and, hey, is there somebody out there? And then leave it running, walk off and not close it. If you use a board, say hello, and at the end of it, say goodbye. Um, and they, the, the lack of respect of it is they sell or were selling. I don't know where they sell them now, but Toys R Us was selling them. And they even had a pink Ouija board for girls several years ago, and I thought I would just 
I thought, no, 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 no. And uh, because it can be dangerous in the way you use it if you don't treat it with respect because you're calling a spirit. And a lot of spirits are out there, and you look like your aura looks like a, a light on a foggy street. So you call to something you don't know, you know, it can turn out weird, but with the right people, the right connection, the right uh, intention, the right respect, you can have spiritual experiences, you can talk to spirits without having uh, the exorcist happen. You know, that's not normal. Um and to say there are things out there you don't want to talk to, but that's where you have to deal with the psychic. If the psychic is developed enough to be able to go, well, that's not such a great thing, or that is, that's, that's, it's all right, or it's not all right, you know. So do everything in moderation and proper. Because the spiritualist movement had a lot of things to it that are still now. That was started in 1848. You're talking to a psychic, and the psychics are out there, Tyler Henry, James Don Prague, uh, the, the um, oh, I can't think of what her name is, the one, the, ma- the madam one, uh, the one with the, 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 the blonde hair, and there was, um, there's one I like named Kim that I've watched on uh, The Hauntings, or uh, Haunting, Um there are some great psychics out there, but we all owe our roots to the spiritualism, to our ancestors going, let's look beyond the flesh. And like I said, you know, someday if somebody wants to do that kind of movement again, we could do it. If you think about it, if you had a religious movement that spoke to the highest good of, of God and yourself, um and accepted everybody, not a country club. Say everybody but the gays or everybody but them or everybody but that. You know, if you included everybody because everybody's a spirit, can you imagine the amount of people who would come to sit and listen to someone talk about how to try and raise your life up, how to be positive, how to be, think of yourself as a spirit, having a human experience. How are you going to, you're here, how are you going to deal with if you have past life issues, you know, get those out of the way. If you have present life issues, get those out of the way. If you succeed, if you fail, it doesn't matter. You know, how are you as a person? You know, because some of us get out of this life with a good life and a good ending. Some of us crash and burn, and we leave this life in a ball of confusion and despair and problems. And, um, you know, we it's kind of like we need to have psychology for the spirit. We have to have psychology for ourselves. But let's be psycho- psychologists for the spirit and to try to move that forward to say we're bigger than the container we're in. And if we really could look at people and say, I accept you as you, not by uh, an outline somebody gives me and says, well, if they don't meet this criteria, they're bad people just because they don't meet your criteria. Not that they're bad people, but, you know, let's get over the country club thing. Spirituality is not a country club. Everyone, when you die, there's a natural process. Everyone goes through that natural process. Then from there on, you know, you get to go and see whoever you're going to go see. But if we made it joyous and made it where people could join hands, raise energy, Sing to the spirit, sing to raise energy, to bring about change, to bring about health, 
take people and put them in the center of a group of people and put love and energy and frequency on them, try to change that cancer, try to change that leukemia, try to change um, the mindset of of self-hurt, self-worthlessness, depression. Um, It would be lovely. And I think it will happen one day. I think it will happen. Um, it needs to happen <laughs> because, and then people are losing interest in the regular religions because, like I said, it's kind of a country club. And if you go to a religion and it's bringing you happiness, it's wonderful. If you go to one and they're telling you how bad you are and never going to be any good, that you have to keep coming to us to bring your money, then there's a problem. Um, with me and my spirituality, I've blossomed in my older age and I feel, I feel pretty positive. You know, I talk a lot of things that tell a lot of stories that are macabre or weird and I sound weird, but I'm actually a happy person. I live in a great house. I live in a great place. I have flowers. I have my beloved animals that I just love and adore. I have a great relationship, uh, you know, and where my house is, it's on water, and I look out, and I see boats in the water, and it looks like a painting, and then I work in a store that is tailor-made for me to do what I do, and then I have a radio show, and I'm doing an album of music that I've written over 40 years that are metaphysical, and I'm making... Right now, I just finished a cough disc I back, which is amazing, you know. So here I am at 60 years old, turning out happiness and products and talking to people. And some of the pop subjects I talk about are kind of dreary, and it's actually I'm a very happy little person. But I'm fascinated by those things. So don't think I'm dour and dreary when I get off here. I mean, I get off this phone and get off this computer and I'm, you know, I've got my life I'm living. I'm making artwork. I'm doing graphic novels. I'm doing books. I'm doing uh, uh, my Mino Grandma's cookbook. I'm getting ready to film videos for to go along with my songs. And I'm happy, happy, happy. And I think everyone should be happy. It shouldn't take you to get to 60 years old to be happy. But if that's so, take it. You know, um, but we all need to heal ourselves and we all need to look under the skin and work with our spirit and understand when it's time to go. We let those spirits go with love and but we're there to support them so that they're okay to leave. They're okay to go. And then, you know, and then the new incoming spirits that come in babies, you know, welcome them in and understand we have to support them. They're not pet rocks. These are spirits having a human experience. We have to teach our children to be good citizens and good people and to have um, love for others and empathy and to try to expand their spirit as far as you can go and then make their own path. Don't just be like everybody. Do something different, and don't be afraid to do something different. Don't be afraid if somebody goes, I don't like that. You know, if it's you and it's what you need to do, be brave. Go where no man has gone before, and, uh, you know, just enjoy your life. Now, anyone that wants to meet me in person, like I said, Fridays and Saturdays, I'm usually at the Live and Let Live in Pensacola. And um, on 4622 South Field Road, you can call the store ahead of time. If you're coming into town, which I actually had someone do the other day, they had my books from Chattanooga, they lived in Chattanooga, they came down here and went, that's you. You know, so. Come into the store, see me, call in beforehand. If I'm not there, call in and see if I can come in. 
uh, to meet you and or come in and see about getting readings by real psychics, see about any metaphysical stuff you have. I mean, we, we, if you need a, if you got a ghost in your house, talk to us. We can probably help you get rid of that. Uh, if you have issues going on, let's help you get figured out. So I want to thank all of you for listening to my show. And I appreciate every single one of you. I hope for all of you to go out there in the world, be the best you. If you have depression, don't let it define you. Try to conquer it. Try to reach beyond it. Reach beyond the pain. Become a good person. Find good friends. Find love. Love your animals because they're very important. And love yourself. So until next week, all of you out there in the dark, we'll see you next Thursday. So have a good week. And good night to all. Good night. You are listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting, Birmingham, Alabama.